All right. So maybe I can start off with a little bit of a statement here, and then we can uh, continue with questions as they come in. So fundamentally, we were pleased today to see that the province did declare the hailstorm that hit Calgary uh, 10 days ago as a natural disaster. Of course it was. Uh, it was a giant storm uh, which has caused incredible damage uh, to tens of thousands of homes and vehicles, which has really been a, a big blow to many people who we're still dealing with, as we all are, economic recession and the public health crisis uh, of COVID. And so it's important that we not only help the city uh, fix its infrastructure, which is part of what the disaster relief program is about, but it is also important that we ensure that we are doing what we can to assist the residents. And that's certainly a question that is still very active and one that we will still need to talk about as we go forward. Uh, first question on the line is from Tom Ross with 660 and City TV. Hi, um, I'm wondering about uh, how you react to the province kind of giving only kind of minimal coverage here. They only say it's uninsurable private property and some municipal damage. So I is that enough? Thanks, Tom. And I will ask uh, my colleague, Councillor Chahal, to address that as well. Adam, I might ask you to turn your camera off just in case anyone's trying to capture video. Um, but... Clearly, this is an important first step. Uh, it's important that the province is in a position to declare this a disaster. And I recognize the Premier's arguments about disaster relief funding should be for uninsurable losses. And a lot of these losses were insurable. But I also take the human side of it and say, you know what, there are a lot of people who are hurting. This is not normal times. And is there something more that we can do for these folks? But maybe I can ask Councillor Chahal to comment. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, the, this is a, the set criteria under the current disaster recovery program. And, um, you know, as the mayor mentioned, a lot of people are uh, in trouble. There's a significant financial challenges as we're uh, in the COVID, post-COVID world uh, as we reopen our economy. And, and this is just another uh, big uh, challenge that they're facing financially. Uh, tremendous amount of damage uh, within the whole ward. And, um, you know, I've said many times, every car that was probably parked on the road is a, a write-off and uh, thousands and thousands of uh, houses damaged, uh, probably over 20,000. Uh, so, you know, it, it's important that uh, it, it is a good first step. Um, it's, you know, the government stepping forward and saying that we do have to do something uh, under the specific criteria that's set out, but we do need to work together to find uh, other solutions as well. Tom, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, I'll just ask about municipal damage as well, just specifically. How, are you able to quantify how much city damage there is at this point? Right now, uh, we are looking at damages to municipal infrastructure plus uh, dam uh, emergency response costs, probably in about the $10 million range. But I got to tell you, those are very, very early numbers. And I wouldn't be surprised if they went up quite a bit. Uh, our disaster relief application uh, has opened the possibility that those numbers could be much higher. The emergency response probably about right because that's done now, but we're still trying to figure out uh, the full extent of damage to municipal infrastructure and property. Next question is Madeline Smith with Post Media. Hey, um, so I'm wondering if uh, Mayor, you and Councillor Chahal can uh, give us a sense of how things are on the ground in terms of um, connecting people to resources. You talked in council um, a couple of weeks ago about the need for volunteers to get out there and help people through the insurance claim process or, or other things they might need. So where's that at right now? And, and what, what are you still looking for to help people out? I'll turn to Councillor Chahal, who has a better view of the on the ground reality uh, probably than I do, uh, even though I do live in the neighborhood. I've been inside uh, a lot uh, lately. I will tell you that it seems to me that community groups and volunteers have really stepped up. The challenge is that we're hearing a lot of stories from people who have it really tough, you know, uh, from, for example, someone I spoke with yesterday who has about $16,000 versus of appraised damage, and he's fully insured, and insurance will pay him 6000 of the fifteen 
because of various deductions and deductibles. So he now has to find $10,000 quite quickly because he's got to fix his house. Um, he's got to fix his car. So these are tough stories. And that that is just one of many stories of folks who uh, are finding themselves in difficult straits. Uh, George? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think where we spent a lot of time on the weekend cleaning up the neighborhood and helping uh, residents out who needed help with waterlogged sofas, carpets, and getting them into those big garbage bins. We had over 30 of them in the ward. Uh, we had a community sports center up at the Genesis Center as well from 9 to 2 on Saturday as a, uh, I'd call it a phase one recovery program and just getting out in the community to help address many questions that concerned residents had. I think the big, what I'm seeing and hearing a lot now is uh, exactly what the mayor said on uh, challenges when it comes to depreciation of siding or roofing materials and they're not getting full value under those insurance policies. Um, and we're still waiting to collect further, I think, information and data from the insurance companies to validate some of that. But residents are saying that they're having challenges uh, with their insurance companies. And I think my big concern is that the insurance companies need to act in good faith, uh, have good faith negotiations um, with their clients who are our residents uh, who've paid into these policies and work together to help them along the way. And I think that's the big question. And we really have to find out um, where the gaps are, who is underinsured, uh, who in what scenarios uh, those individuals are having a tough time, and, and then what we can advocate for uh, to make sure that those insurance companies are fulfilling their requirements under those policies and making sure that they are funding a full recovery of those uh, building structures. Follow up, Madeline? Um, yeah, so you both said that this is a, a good first step today. Uh, is, is there more that you're going to be looking for from the province in the sort of weeks to come? What else are you hoping to see? This is a very difficult question. The Premier today spoke about moral hazard and not wanting to bail out insurance companies. And look, he's right. You don't want to have a situation where people are encouraged to not have insurance because the government will bail them out. But we also have to be very human about this. And we have to be very understanding that in the time of COVID, in the time of recession, people who lost their work, like the person I mentioned earlier, both he and his wife have been out of work. And we've got to think of some way that we can be helpful to people, because this is what I'm worried about. These are not optional expenses. You got to fix your house. If you don't fix the siding on your house, you're going to get mold. The house is going to rot. That's going to be a much worse problem for everybody. So you got to fix your house. But who amongst us can just find $10,000? And so if people are putting that on a credit card at 22% interest, if they are borrowing the money from a payday loan company, I worry that that's really going to put people into poverty traps that they'll never be able to get out of. So while we have to abide by the principle here that disaster relief should be for uninsured losses, we also have to be human beings about this and ensure that we're not getting into unintended consequences of forcing people into poverty or much more expensive uh, reliance on government programs in the future. So I don't know the answer. I don't know what that looks like. But I think that it's important for us to ask those questions and see where we as a community, as a government, can really help folks. George? Yeah, no, I, I uh, agree with everything you said. I think um, it, it's an extreme challenge for many um, with everything that's gone on with COVID now, with, with this massive storm and to come up with money when, uh, you know, some families don't have technology or hardware for their kids to do uh, homeschooling. Um, you know, that's been a big challenge. And so th they're, folks are going to be making those tough decisions. And if it's $2,500 to, to pay a deductible, and then that you have a depreciated value on your siding or your roof, uh, then you have to come up with more money. That's going to be a real problem. So I think we need to address that ensure that the folks who need help, that we do find ways to help them um, and ensure that we have the appropriate, uh, you know, avenues to do so. And there's a number of ways we, we can. Um, I think that's us sitting down and uh, really finding who needs help and how we can help them. Uh, and it's us, you know, advocating uh, to the provincial government to uh, to look at some of those initiatives. Uh, I don't see any further hands raised, nor have I received any further text messages. Are there any more questions uh, for the mayor and councillor? Oh, I uh, have one here from Scott Dipple with CBC. 
Does the mayor see a need for some people to get cash? Debit cards are sometimes issued by government in disasters. Not huge sums, total payments, but help for immediate expenses for those who qualify. $300, $500 type of level? I think that's an option well worth pursuing. You know, we're not dealing with the kind of crisis where we've got to literally give people debit cards today to buy food. Uh, but we are dealing with a situation where over the upcoming days and in the next couple of weeks, people are going to start to see very large bills. So we don't need that emergency cash distribution that you might need if people have been you know, thrown out of their houses uh, and don't have the ability to feed their families. But I think that there is going to need to be some sort of a program to help people get started at least on these repairs. Uh, next question is from Tom Ross. Uh, I asked this question uh, to George on uh, Friday as well, but I'm just curious if there's any follow up on uh, what sort of um, things can be done in the future to help uh, provide more early awareness to these types of storms and, and what sort of long term plans are in place to uh, limit the damage, such as discussions being held about building materials and other things like that. Well, I'll invite George because he's been thinking a lot about this, but uh, certainly the insurance companies participate in a hail suppression program. In this case, the storm came on uh, and that just didn't happen for whatever reason. And I, I don't know more about why that didn't happen. Uh, I do think that there is an opportunity here to talk about building materials. You don't want to overreact, but when you see the devastation that was caused, Listen, I probably would have preferred a little more money on my mortgage for more durable uh, exterior coverings for my house than to have to deal with this and be a lot of money out of pocket or a lot of money in insurance premiums uh, later on. So I'm very willing to have that conversation, whether it's with the provincial or the national building codes. George? Yeah, and I agree. And I've been uh, saying that, you know, we need more resilient and sustainable building products on the exteriors of these homes to protect uh, to protect them. And, you know, that's where even right now through this recovery process, uh, we really need to find ways to make it easy on folks to, you know, look at above and beyond what their insurance companies or company, if they do want to upgrade, what can we do to help them help get them there? And so there are a few ideas that I am working with um, that I think we can easily do, such as uh, offering tax credits to uh, above and beyond an insurance claim that the government could provide. Uh, we also have to look at, you know, as a city, in, in my opinion, is uh, being a smart city is, you know, do we have the appropriate sensors deployed in many of our uh, stormwater retention ponds and dry ponds and pipes, um, even in our roads to early detection uh, to provide us uh, an early warning system and to deploy the right resources out to those areas in need. So these are, I mean, you know, conversations that I've been having already and that we'll be having, I think, further in the upcoming days. And I think this will help build a stronger and more resilient community in Ward 5 with better building materials. Uh, and I think the big thing we have to keep in mind is housing affordability, as the mayor mentioned. Uh, for some folks, they're on the tip right now of being able to pay their bills or not. And we don't want to price folks out of the housing market by putting on additional costs. But I think there are many innovative, innovative ways to, to do so with uh, protecting housing affordability as well. Follow up, Tom? No, that's all for me. Thank you. Okay. Um, we're seeing no further questions here. I do have one uh, unrelated to this topic from Scott Dipple at CBC. Imagine that. Uh, could the mayor provide a preview about Monday's special council meeting, what it's about, what you hope comes out of the day? Sure. There are three items on the council meeting for Monday. Uh, two of, the, And they're all focused on the immediate recovery, Calgary's comeback, as well as on the more medium term uh, economic resilience and recovery of the city. So in the morning, we'll be hearing from our city manager a little bit about his plan for the organization uh, and the corporation, uh, as well as the city as a whole in terms of this immediate post COVID period. Secondly, we will be getting the final recommendations of the financial task force, a group of citizen experts who have been counseling the city on how we should be thinking about our budget and finances going forward. And that's a pretty weighty report. So we'll be spending some time with that. And then in the afternoon, uh, we'll be spending some time uh, in closed session with uh, my council colleagues doing some scenario planning and some big picture strategy thinking to see how our plans for the city have changed in this post-pandemic post world.